Church, let's go ahead and stand together and sing, Alas, and did my Savior bleed. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Well, my the sun in darkness hide and shut his glory in. When Christ the mighty maker died for men, the creature's sin. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. far away on a hill far away stood an old rocket cross the emblem of suffering and shame and I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. And so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay. cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, the old rugged cross, so despised by the His glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. And so I'll cherish the old rugged cross 
Till my trophies at last I lay down And I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown To the old to the old rugged cross, I will ever be true in shame and reproach, gladly bear. Then he'll call, then he'll call me someday to my home far away. song you may know. Um, It's a very familiar favorite, um, but it just talks about all of everything that we do being devoted to Christ. All glory be to Him, all honor and praise. So just let this be your prayer for this upcoming year, that everything we would do, we would give glory to Him. King 
to you. Thank you, Lord, for loving us even when we're not lovable. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us and all you're going to do. Thank you, Lord, for this offering we're about to receive and you get to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Happy New Year. Year. You guys, I'm so glad to see you all here today. Did you uh, stay up and see the New Year in? I I stayed up. Oh, oh, pardon me. The uh, children, if you would like to leave, Miss Jeanette is there at the back for Children's Church. I stayed up to the late hour of 9 (laughs) p.m. I had to tell my wife Happy New Year's today, but I think that's probably been going on for years. I'm not not a late late night person. Open your Bibles with me to Nehemiah chapter 9. We're looking at chapter 9 and chapter 10 today. We're starting with just three verses, first three verses of chapter 9. When you get your spot... Stand with me if you're able, and we'll read. Now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it, they made confession and worshiped the Lord their God. Let's pray together. Lord, we are grateful for the opportunity to gather. We do pray that by your Spirit, you would touch each of our hearts. I pray that our ears would be open to hear your word. I pray that you would convict us, that you would challenge us, that you would give us direction as a church, particularly as we head into the new year. May we be strongly about your work, faithful in all that you call us to do. We thank you, we praise you, for you are faithful, and you are God of strength and power. Use us this year to continue to reach our community and beyond. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. There's a pastor out of the Dallas area. His name is Tony Evans. Probably a lot of you have watched him or heard of him. He, he wrote in a book one time about a, a situation or a sickness called loser's limp. Have you ever heard of loser's limp? I know my wife has. We laugh about this. Well, loser's limp is what happens when you say an outfielder is running for a fly ball and they, they miss it. Our, our wide receiver has the ball come right into his hands and he drops it to the turf. And then immediately after that happens, these players fall to the turf and they get up maybe clutching their legs and they begin to limp off the field. What do they want you to think? That this sudden malady, either a pulled muscle or a cramp or something else, has impacted their ability. They're, they're taking one for the team, so to speak, but it's impacted their ability to do what they were supposed to be doing. They fall to the ground and they get up limping. And the purpose of the limp is to take attention away from the failure. The impression that a player wants to give the team is is the reason that they didn't make that catch was this sudden malady. Well, it happens. We see it all the time. The limp becomes an excuse for poor play. And instead of owning up to the failure, the limp offers an excuse, giving the impression that forces beyond what I can control have caused me to be less than I should have been. They blame the outside forces or even present forces situations on the current circumstances. Loser's limp is hard to swallow, isn't it? It's hard to swallow when we see it on the playing field. I think it's even harder for us to swallow when we see it in the church. And I would honestly say it is excuseless. It is time that we stop blaming outside circumstances. It is time that that we stop looking at present struggles and blaming it for ourselves not being ready, not being faithful to God. We can't blame these things on God. What does it mean for ministry? It means a couple things. It means foresight. 
It means planning. It means preparation. If God has called you to lead, you are to be ready to lead. I think about an example, even when we were doing our fall ministry recognition day, ministry emphasis day, and, and I'm not picking in a bad way on Debbie, but Debbie took over doing our prayer walking that day. But she didn't just show up and say, let's pray, which would have been okay. But she went into great detail, having scriptures to be read, certain things to be prayed over. She was ready for that moment. What about our Sunday school teachers? Are they ready for the moment? What about your preacher? Is he ready for that moment? He better be, and they better be. Yeah, thank you for that amen. I noticed he saved that just for me. But, but I, I, I'm, I'm good with that because we do not walk into a responsibility the Lord has called us to without being ready for that responsibility. And that's what our sermon is about today, being, being ready. My, my sermon title is Throwing Away the Crutches, but it's that loser's limp idea. Throw away the crutches and do what God calls you to do. It is often said of churches that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. I do not know if that is true. All I can say that if it is true, there are a lot of people robbing God from what he is expecting them to do. Not only are they robbing God, but they're robbing each other. Because it, it is not about us. It is about God's work taking place here. There are people here that need your work. We'll talk about it more in just a little bit. But I want us to see these things today, giving to, to God what he deserves of us, ministering to others because we have been ministered to, to, the pe to be the people of God and the church that he wants us to do. These are things we got to do. Throw away the crutches. Stop limping and answer up and be ready to do when God calls you to do something. Two weeks ago, we were challenged by Scripture to be obedient to God, no matter, no matter how far he calls us to go. And this week we go a little bit further. We look at what that obedience may call us to do, how, how it plays out in our lives. We'll look at what the Israelites do and, and model, I, I pray, model our responses to how they responded. Our passage a couple weeks ago led us to discuss the hunger that people had for God's word. Now, did you notice when we, we read through those first three verses what was going on on that day, how long did they gather for, for, for hearing the word of God? Did you catch it? A quarter of the day. And then what did they do after that? A quarter of the day they spent in confession and, and prayer. That's a long service, isn't it? So don't complain if we go an hour. That's nothing. That's, that's nothing compared to what they went through. Well, we will see the hunger of the Israelites working in their hearts as they make a realization. That's what they did in those first three verses. That was a realization that they had come to. There was a spiritual awareness brought on by a time of fasting. That is pointed out in Scripture. They were fasting. Their mind was, was more in tune spiritually with what God wanted them to, to hear. There was a sense of genuine remorse. It showed in how they dressed. And did you catch this? They, had, they had put earth on their faces. They were, I guess, somber looking, but they were so focused. It was not a time of celebration. This was a time of repentance. It was a time of confession in their lives. There was also a desire to be holy. Look in verse 2. You see this word. They, they separated themselves. And that is very much what holiness is, being set apart, separated for God in this case. There was also an acknowledgment of responsibility in their confession. They were the ones, even their parents were the ones who had sinned against God and they were making this recognition at this point. There was a recognition also of God's majesty in their worship. It wasn't coming and singing three songs. They sang and worshiped and praised for much of the day. But they were pointing out how good God was in all this. Now, their heightened spiritual state led them to pray. We didn't read through this whole prayer, but in verses 5 of, of chapter 9, all the way through the end of the chapter, verse 38, you will see the longest recorded prayer in the Bible. It's a lot of verses. There's a lot of things going on there. But the prayer is a statement of utter dependence, utter confidence, complete confidence in God. 
Their, their reflections brought them to a conclusion. And this is, this is very beautiful. I want, if your Bibles are still open, look at the last verse of chapter 9. You may have to turn two pages. And in verse 38, this is the conclusion of the prayer. And we read there, because of all this, all these confessions and these recognitions, because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing on the sealed document on the sealed document are the names of our princes, 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 our Levites, and our priests. The people were anxious to alter their lives. We've been living one way. We are ready to live another way. They determined to do the things that were important, putting first things first. So after verbally declaring, confessing their sin, repenting from it, and that's a big deal. We, we talk about it. And I think some churches do better than others about recognizing it's not just saying that we are sorry. It's not just saying we're sorry. It is a turn. And this is very simple, but I think it's important for us to see from time to time. When we are in sin, when we recognize that, yes, you want to have a contrite spirit. You want to be sorry for it. But confession of it and then the step further repentance of it, of it causes you to do this. I just want you to see this picture. Very simple. If this is your path to sin, when you repent, you go exactly the opposite way. And that is forsaking the sin and moving toward holiness in this case. And I think it's a good picture for us to be reminded of from time to time. Very simple, but a good reminder. So the Israelites had verbally confessed they were repenting of their sin, and they wanted to document the decisions in writing by signing their names. If you look at chapter 10, these first 27 verses in chapter 10 are the names of all those who, have signed, who signed this agreement that they were making. Why was that important? Think about that for a moment. You don't even have to answer out loud. But why? It was very important that they did that. The importance of writing is that their written priorities didn't get fuzzy. You know, when we, we, we say, actually, I, I can think about this very quickly. I think it's funny. Richard Jones has told me right before the service, he said, 2022, he, he had a friend tell him this, 2022 went by so fast, I didn't even have time to lose weight. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think about things that we think about. We're going to do such and such for the Lord. We're going to do such and such in our personal lives. And a month later, did I really say I was going to give up sweets this year? Nah, that's, that's maybe give up cookies on days that, that, that don't end in Y, you know? And so, and anyway, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. When we don't write, there's no accountability to it. So this gave accountability. It didn't allow things to get fuzzy. Don't you remember that you signed this document and this is what you agreed to do? So they signed. And, and they, they made promises. There are three promises I want us to look at today. The first, we've got to go to chapter 10 now. So if you're still open, you may have to turn another page. Look at chapter 10, verse 30. We will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. So the first promise is this. We promise to obey God in our homes. We promise to obey God in our homes. Jerusalem was surrounded by, by heathen tribes, pagan people, and they marched to a different beat. In many ways of life, primarily in their worship, it was different. There were people, as you look through history, there were people that were worshiping their gods but doing some very terrible things in their worship. I mean, even, even to the point of, of child sacrifice. I mean, it was terrible things. God, from the beginning, had set apart the people, his nation of Israel. By intermarrying, the people of God would have lost their distinctiveness. Because we see it in our day. You, you have people that, that come from slightly different belief systems. When they marry, that what, what do the children believe? Well, it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And, and it, it gets fuzzy. It gets diluted. Here... This promise said, the parents were making a promise, we're not going to shrug our soul, shoulders when our children want to marry outside of our faith. God wants it to be pure. We want it to be pure. And they, they realized something. And, and you, can, you will, I hope, agree with this statement. They realized that when the morals of a nation suffer, the home 
is the first to suffer. And that's so important that we see it. Billy Graham, and when you hear this, you're going to say, I mean, he must have just wrote this yesterday. Of course he didn't. But listen to these words from Billy Graham. Years ago, the immutable law of sowing and reaping has held sway. We are now the hapless possessors of moral depravity, and we seek in vain for cure. The tares of indulgence have overgrown the wheat of moral restraint. Our homes have suffered. When the morals of society are upset, the family is the first to suffer. The home is the basic unit of society, and a nation is only as strong as her homes. Do you not agree? It could have been written right there today, this week. So when we look to set priorities, home is a good place to start. It's a good place to start. You know, I want to say something right now, and, and it, it really just about God's perfect timing. It is New Year, a new year. And I feel like he gave this chapter for us this day to start our new year, to examine these promises. What are we going to do in our homes? Well, let's look at the second promise. Second promise they made is to conduct business in an obedient manner. Look at verse 31, just one verse down. And if the peoples of the land, that's the outsiders, if the, the, that did not live in Jerusalem, and if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. And we will forego the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. Now, if you don't know what that last sentence is referring to, every seventh year, God had declared that the land would have a Sabbath. They were not to plant that year. But here was, here was what God did. He made the crop so great in the, the year before, and even in the coming year, that they never suffered. Do what I say, and I will bless you, I will honor you. And they were doing that part. Even to this part, if you've loaned to a brother, forgive them that debt. Forgive them. And they were doing that. So this was not a meaningless promise, though, because I want you to think these are still business people. They're real people. They were hungry. They were busy. They were pushed then by other cultures to do business on the Sabbath. Oh, God has just said we are to be set apart. We are not to do any business on the Sabbath day. How do we tell these people that? Well, they had to. They had to stand up to them and say, we will not do business on, the day, on this day. So they began to look at their business as God did. They released their brothers from that debt that was owed in the seventh year. They rested their land in the seventh year when they were supposed to. They did their business, here is a key, with integrity. They did their business with integrity. They put in a day's work. Oh, that's an interesting concept, getting paid and working a day. They did their day's work. They were punctual. They were honest. They were honest. Keith Miller, in his book, The Taste of New Wine, says, It has never ceased to amaze me that we as Christians have developed a kind of selective vision which allows us to be deeply and sincerely involved in worship and church activities and yet almost totally pagan in the day-in, day-out guts of our business lives and never even realize it. Does that not speak to us? Because people... We make, make our appearance at church, but then we go do our business like the world. And that's what Keith Miller was addressing. So we had to promise to be obedient to God in the way families are, are raised. So that the, Jeru the, the Israelites were doing that. And now they make the promise to be obedient to God in the way they conduct business. Well, there's a third promise here. And the third promise was to be obedient to God in their place of worship. Now this promise runs the rest of that chapter. We're going to read it. We have enough time. Verse 32, I start there all the way to the end of chapter 10. We also take on ourselves the obligation to give yearly a third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our God, for the showbread, the regular grain offering, the regular burn offering, the Sabbaths, the new moons, the appointed feasts, the holy things, and the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and for all the work in the house of our God. By the way, if you want, start counting how many times we say house of God in this passage. We, the priests, the Levites, and the people have likewise cast lots for the wood offering to bring into the house of God. 
according to our Father's houses, at times appointed year by year to burn on the altar of the Lord our God, as it is written in the law. We obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit of every tree year by year to where? The house of the Lord. Also to bring to the house of our God, to the priest who minister in the house of our God, the firstborn of our sons and our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the firstborn of our herds and our flocks, and to bring the first of our dough and our contributions the fruit of every tree, the wine and the oil to the priests, to the chambers of the house of our God, and to bring to the Levites the tithes from our ground. For it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all the towns where we labor. And the priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive the tithes. And the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithes, which is 10% of that 10% given to them, they shall bring it up the tithe of the tithe to the house of God, to the chambers of the storehouse. Verse 39. For the people of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of grain, wine, and oil to the chambers, where the vessels of the sanctuary are, as well as the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers. It's all summed up right here. Last verse in that, in that chapter. Read it with me. We, read it out loud, we will not neglect the house of our God. And that sums up everything that was made, said in this last promise, to be obedient to the place of worship and to the God who had ordained that worship. Nine times, if you, I don't know if you count it, nine times in this section is mentioned, the house of the Lord or the house of God. Verse 39 again pulls it all together. Say it again with me. We will not neglect the house of our God. Literally, the people were saying this, that they would offer the financial resources necessary so that the worship of God could continue. Now, that's what's so important. Not only for the generation presently being minister to there and worshiping there, but for the next generation. And if the Lord does not return, for the next generation and a generation after that. And that is what we have talked about in this time as we begin our building campaign, our building fund campaign, restoration campaign to restore what we've been given. Not necessarily for us, but we will enjoy it. We will enjoy it because it will bring beauty, restore some beauty that we have come to appreciate but even more so, it will have this place so that the next generation continues to hear the Word of God. And we continue to see people changed by that. So important for us, each individual, here we've got this up now, each individual recognized personal responsibility to see that the temple was not neglected. Now, I don't know if you caught this when we were reading. You probably did. You may not have thought about it as heavily. I'm not saying deeply. But did you notice that even woodcutters were necessary. And, and you think sometimes, well, I don't have anything to give to the church, meaning of, of yourself, you don't have a gift, you don't have a talent. Man, they, there were people that were cutting wood, however they cut it back then. They were cutting wood, and it was necessary in offering the burning of the sacrifices, keeping that fire going. And I just want you to be reminded, I told you I'd talk about this again in a moment, your part is important. Every single one of us, your part that you can do is important in the eyes of God. You have a role, and that role, again, may, may be for the people that are sitting beside you or across the aisle from you. Each individual in that day recognized personal responsibility to see that the house of God was not neglected. Now, how so? I'll give you three ways. The people of God did not neglect their giving. They brought their tithes into the storehouse. That's number one. Number two, they did not neglect their service. I just spoke about that. Even if it was wood cutting, that was important. And they did their service for the Lord. Number three, the people of God did not neglect their presence. Their presence. Are you important? Absolutely. You know, when people walk in to any church, they're going to look around and see, well, if there's only two people there, think, wow, what's, what's going on here? But when they begin to see more people worshiping the Lord, they recognize that there's something going on. The Lord is speaking here, and they will become drawn to that. Even with our children, you know, it's important. I love that our children come in before they depart for their children's church because we want even our visitors to see, yes, there are children here. They just happen right now to be over in the other building. 
And those things are important. Presence is important. Now, write this down. I didn't give it, give it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. And I, I feel like you will be able to fill in the blanks or help me quote the Scripture. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you? Whom you have received from God. You are not your own. Yep, you're not your own. You were bought at a price. What is that price? It was a very, very death. And then, thank goodness, the resurrection. Thank God, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You were bought at a price. Therefore, do what? Honor God with your own body. Now, is your temple well maintained? Is, is your temple clean? And I go back to this part. What was going on with the Israelites? They were in confession. They were in repentance or they repented of their sin. Their temples were clean and ready to be inhabited by the Holy Spirit of God so that then they might go out and do the work of God. And that's where we need to be. Kierkegaard told a parable of a wild duck. I'm going to read his story. It's very powerful. I think you'll like this. It's an illustration of how a soul can decline from ideals and be satisfied with lower standards. He writes, This duck was flying with his mates in the springtime northward across Europe. During the flight, he came down in a Danish barnyard where there were tame ducks. He enjoyed some of their corn. He stayed for an hour, then for a day, then for a week, then for a month. And finally, because he relished the good fare and the safety of the barnyard, he stayed all summer. One autumn day, when the flock of wild ducks came across the barnyard, winging their way southward again, he was stirred with a strange thrill of joy and delight. With a great flipping of wings, he rose in the air to join his old comrades in flight. But he found that his good fare had made him so soft and heavy that he could rise no higher than the eaves of the barn. So he dropped back again to the barnyard, and he said to himself, Oh well, my life is safe here, and the food is good. Every spring and autumn, when he heard the wild ducks overhead, his eyes would gleam for a moment, and he would begin to flap his wings. But finally the day came when the wild ducks flew over him and uttered their cry, but he paid not the slightest attention to them. What a parable of how the soul can forget its high standards and be content with lower things. Go back to this question. Is your temple clean and well-maintained? If not, take the necessary steps today. Now, as individuals, we, we first, in, in getting to that point, need to ask a question. Do we know Jesus personally? Have you received forgiveness of sin? If, and if you have not, do that today. As God calls you, ask Jesus right now. I say pray. It is a prayer. In your own words, in your heart, pray, dear Lord Jesus, please take away my sin and give me forgiveness. And ask him to do this too. And he'll do it. Ask him to direct your steps of your life from this day forward. Back more to this, this question here before us. Is your temple clean? We backslide from time to time. Sin comes into our lives, maybe slowly like that last parable, but it takes hold, it takes root, and we need to turn from it. Won't you commit to doing that today? Won't you commit as individuals, hence as a church, to be all that God would want us to be and desires us to be to reach our community, and even beyond. Would you agree to that? Will you commit to that? Let's stand and pray. Lord, we are grateful for the day. Again, we thank you for, for Scripture. We thank you for your perfect timing. I pray that this message is, is, in a way, something that will get us started and reflective on where we are and where we need to be. So, Lord, I pray for us as a church. Hear our confession of the times that we have failed you. 
Please forgive us of our sins. May we turn from them and be the men and women that you want us to be, the boys and girls, the teenagers, the students that you want us to be. And Lord, now as we have a time of commitment, may we each examine our hearts. And if we are not right with you, right before you, may we respond today asking for forgiveness and possibly even walking the aisle, making public our profession of faith in you, making public our need for you, maybe to come and kneel at this altar in prayer, asking for your great and powerful hand to be upon us. Lord, I pray that if you have a decision, it may be to unite with this church family. There may be other things going on in their lives that they need. Give them courage at this very moment to step During this time of invitation and in the days that follow, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you have a decision to make as we come together, won't you respond? Sam is here, I'll be down front. You may come and kneel at this altar in prayer. But if you have a question about your relationship with Jesus, please don't walk out the door, but respond this day to his call in your life. Brother Ethan. Be Thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that Thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, Thy presence my light. Be Thou my wisdom, and Thou my true word. And I ever with Thee, and Thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, and I thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling, and I with thee one. In riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and Thou only be first in my heart. I keep heaven, my treasure thou art. And high King of heaven, my victory won. And may I reach heaven's joy, so bright heaven's sun. And heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. And be thou my vision, O Lord of Thou art Thou my best song by day or by night waking or sleeping Thy presence my life and be Thou my way 
and thou my true word and I ever with thee and thou with me Lord thou my great father and I thy true son thou said amen. amen hey you guys just be seated for for a moment i have some introductions to make uh, mary donna complete now i was laughing because when mike's this is mike thompson's sister mary donna nichols but every time i hear mike say it it sounds like he's saying madonna madonna <laughs> so, so this is madonna nichols but not really it's mary donna nichols she comes today by transfer of letter to, to unite with the church family. All those in favor of receiving her upon her transfer of letter indicate by saying amen. amen. Of course, there are no others. Okay, Sunday school teacher or family. Uh, yeah, come on up. Come on. Let me get y'all to stand over on this side if you would, Mary Donna. Y'all come. Let me switch places with y'all. And we have Shalette Baker coming this morning. Now, Shalette, as she said, is coming back home. She, she has lived in Houston for a while, but she comes today also by transfer letter to reunite with the Dorcas Wills Church family. All those in favor of receiving her indicate by clapping or saying amen. 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 Can we get it? Yes, you can do both, both, y'all. So, do we have a Sunday school teacher, our department leader? We got, we got, okay, Jeff, come on over, Jeff. Can we, can we get this moved? I'm afraid it will trip somebody. All right, so on your way out, please come by and welcome these two ladies into the church home. We are so excited for y'all to make that decision today. And as I pray with them, and I know you pray the same thing, may they encourage us, may we encourage them. So let's stand together, and we will, we will close in prayer. Dr. Frank, would you close us in prayer, please? Amen. Amen. You okay? I'll get you.